in regards to animation, at what stage of the process do you, you know, begin working? Um, I start on those. I started on those animated films much earlier than a traditional sound designer would start on most traditional films. The reason for that is that those animated films had a three and a half to four year gestation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the very early stages, four years out from a release, um, sees them recording the voices and building what they call the radio play, which is the assembled audio long before there's any animation at all. In fact, very often on those films, we wouldn't see final animation till months or weeks before completion of the film. So there's this process where um, uh, an artist has drawn storyboards, you know, stills of the extremes of the action, and you get a, a, a crude sense of the progression of the story. They've laid up the voices to those storyboards, and they're wanting for sound. So on all three of those films, I started as early as about two, two and a half years before their release, designing sounds for things that you couldn't pull from a library and um, providing them to the film editor to lay in against dialogue and music. Usually it would be music pulled from a music library because the composer may not have been hired. Although in the case of Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin, we knew it was going to be um, Alan Menken. So uh, my job would be to begin the process of sound exploration, either designing sounds for things that didn't exist, uh, like Bell's father's crazy wood chopping machine, something yeah. that doesn't exist in reality, uh, or Aladdin's flying carpet, um, and providing them to the filmmakers to start building out the radio play so they could get a, a, a much more full, a fuller sense of how the scene worked and what it, what it would ultimately be. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you have, do you feel like you have a bit more creative freedom then? Cause I know like a lot of the time you're somewhat informed by like, if you were shooting a live action film, your sound design is, has to be informed by what's on the screen. But if you've just got dialogue and music, do you, or are you, are they very strict about, okay, we want this sound here sort of thing. Often the sound I provide is dictated by what is seen because they are what we call diegetic sounds. They are sounds that have a relationship to what you see on screen. If you see somebody fall down or open a door, to, yep. to sort of the crudest examples, you have to provide that sound because one of the joys of sound design for animation is that it's a blank slate. It is the literal tabula rasa, just as is the animation. No imagery exists until an animator draws a sketch. And now you see things start to come to life. And then those sketches turn into layout and those layouts turn into animation. And then that animation gets lit. And then that, you know, and it goes through the iteration process to you have a fully realized lifelike rendition of what the artists and the directors intended. So too with sound, um, there is no sound other than the recorded voice, you know, Animation starts life with bringing actors into studios and recording the script as written mm -hmm. and hopefully allowing some amount of improvisation. And then those performances are assembled together uh, by the film editor into a cohesive whole that feels like a story. And then you begin to analyze that. And as that process develops, I'm adding sounds to flesh it out, even sounds for things you're not seeing. There might be storyboards that don't have any reference to the sound we want to hear, but the filmmakers want to hear those sounds in advance so they can weigh in on the quality uh, of the sound or the uh, sort of innovation of that sound. And in really um, uh, rare circumstances, the sound can drive the animation. And that's the big win in sound design is that if you can develop something from your imagination and place it in, in the radio play, the animators will actually draw to it and follow the sync that you laid out, and it might inspire inspire a visual look that it might not otherwise have. Yeah, I do love it when sound design is able to tell the story so that you don't have to show something. That's sound design is very economical. I mean, yeah. you can 
you can tell, you, you can speak volumes, no pun intended, about a character or a situation with a very brief sound that might take many, many seconds of exposition, meaning talking by the characters to set that up for you. Yeah. Or like, you know, like an example that we use when I'm teaching at uni um, is that if you can get away with hearing a door, to go off your example, if hearing a door open, you might not necessarily have to show the door open. Like a door opening is not overly interestingly, like interesting visually, but yeah. if you want to focus on a character's face and you can hear the door, it's much more interesting and you can get away with it. And like you said, it can also be a lot cheaper as far well, as time on set. Um, you, you bring up an interesting um, point about the door because a door is a very mundane sound. There's nothing interesting designed about a door. But imagine if you're on the character's face and you hear the door open and, and you don't see it, but what you then hear is what's on the other side of the door. Yeah. Now you're really expanding the frame, as we say, by hearing something that the character can then react to that would otherwise take some other amount of wordiness to describe it, but mm. the sound is all you need to say, here's what they're confronting when they cross through that doorway. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as far as the music goes, are you collaborating with the, like, as far as you getting the music into your mix and then sending them sounds, is it a collaborative process or do you kind of work solo and then the re-recording mixer just kind of puts it all together? It's yeah. a, 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 a spectrum depending on the sensibilities of the filmmakers and the composer. I have been advocating for years the value of a collaboration between composers and sound designers because there's only one soundtrack and you want that to be as seamless and symbiotic as possible. I, I think it's irresponsible on everyone's part, uh, the filmmakers, the composer and the sound designer to wait till the mix because you're, you're in a way you're, 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 you're premeditating a disaster without without flagging it to anyone. Um, if the composer doesn't know what I'm doing or vice versa, how could we have something that feels so seamless it 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 comes off as inevitable? And I think this is this is a word we might use more and more that when a soundtrack works, it works because it feels inevitable, meaning everything is so right, it could only have been one way. Those things don't happen by accident. They happen through ordination and coordination and and collaboration. And that requires a, 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 um, a very forward-thinking group of filmmakers. And I would argue, and maybe hopefully you can correct me, I haven't seen much of that taught in even modern film school. This notion that um, the composer and the director and the sound designer should work together early on to establish those relationships and come up with the most pleasing soundtrack. Yeah, I think it's definitely something missing. I definitely, we, I see the relationship between sound designer and director being very, at least from my point of view, because of where I come from, being very important and being taught, mm. but definitely bringing the composer as a into that mix is something missing. And what I think is also really missing is um, sound designer and picture editor working sure. together. I feel like a lot of the time the picture editor is done with the director, you get given a cut, and then you get sent a cut as a sound designer, and it's already there. Yeah. Whereas you're going, hey, if I do this, the picture edit might actually change, and mm. you might get a better edit because of my sound design. Um, sure. Uh, let me um, take a little bit of a detour to uh, the, a film I did last year called Dune, which we, mm. we, we just mentioned. Um, Denis Villeneuve and his uh, editor, Joe Walker, are very progressive, forward-thinking filmmakers, so much so that we, meaning my uh, Theo Green, who was my sound design partner on Dune, we are brought on during production while the film wow. is being shot. Now, what that begats is 
Joe will put together a, a, a set of dailies and arrive at a rough edit. And he knows the edit doesn't live on its own until the sound has been applied. Theo and I will create sound. And very often, the sound informs a re-edit. Once Joe hears the way sound drives the scene to either a great degree or maybe a very minor degree, but if it's to a great degree, he will immediately realize sound's working great here. The edit really needs to be this mm. other thing. And we're informing the edit um, symbiotically as the film is being shot. To go one step further, we are developing sounds that we don't have visual effects for. And often, if the sound is compelling enough, that sound is then sent to visual effects and visual effects will animate to it. Mm -hmm. They'll send us their version of what the look might be based on the timings that sound set out. And then we refine the sound and we iterate. And for nine months, that process of iteration creates this cohesion and this inevitability that I was talking about that makes Dune feel like a seamless film, like everything is working perfectly, but it didn't happen by accident. Mm -hmm. And the, the sound design of Dune is so like the diegetic sounds is so important to the world building. Like it's what makes you really, I find sound design is immersive in a way that special effects just can't quite match. So when you're sitting there in the theatre and you've got the big surround sound and you're, it's this experience, it's so important like of making you feel like you're really a part of that world because it is so alien. And, um, and yeah, I think that, that collaboration must have played a huge role in getting to that sort of end goal, I guess, um, rather than feeling like it was something tacked on at the last minute. Well, uh, let, let me tell you another brief story about Dune, which addresses exactly what you talked about. Um, we begin the discussion, uh, uh, Theo and I and Denis and Joe began discussions about the design of the film early on. Um, in very maybe metaphysical terms, um, we we very often what we do on films, not only on Denise films, but other films, is attempt to create a credo or a, a methodology that we will work within. We, we try to define the universe that mm. we are building worlds for. Um, and on Dune... As we talked through what our movie sounded like, we, we had discussions about not just what it should sound like, but what it shouldn't sound like. And as we, as we, as we completed those discussions, we began to discover some, some similar themes and ideas that we didn't really like synthetic sounds. We didn't like synthesizer sounds because they felt like a trope from another era of science fiction films. And Denis would pose to Theo and I this challenge that was he wanted the film to sound like a documentary, as if you dropped a camera and a sound recordist and a boom pole and a, a boom person on Arrakis and what the audience experiences felt like something you could have experienced yourself had you actually been there. And from that, Theo and I extracted our mantra, if you will, which was something we called FDR, fake documentary realism. And that was the oral, aural, A-U-R-A-L, yes. filter through which all si sound was heard. If it didn't feel as though it was something that you would have captured with a boom mic, if it didn't feel, for lack of a better term, acoustic, Mm -hmm. And hence, real, it didn't belong in our film. And so it was that process of intellectualizing the sound and finding a framework to live within um, that we, we, we would find the sound of Dune. And that's why Dune sounds the way it does, through those discussions, through that ideation process. It, sat, it really felt like the sound design was alien. Like if you compare it to like Star Wars, for instance, they're earth sounds in space. Whereas I felt like when we were watching June, I was on another planet with alien sounds that don't belong on earth. 
which <laughs> I think ha- has a different experience almost. Like you really feel like in Star Wars, they're Earth characters, you know, dotting around space or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. Whereas this was, these are alien characters and it's an alien world with an alien sound. Um, yeah. Which yeah. is more immersive, I guess, than um, just having Earth, like an Earth sound design on another planet. Right. Well, uh, funny you say that because we developed a really funny thing to tease each other with, which was that we believed Denis asked Theo and I to make sounds that no one has ever heard before sound like they've heard them before. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. No simple challenge, believe me. Um, So I've seen you state before that... um, you see sound design as a form of music and that all organized sound is music in a way. Um, do you think the audience sort of interprets it the same way as music, that they use it to understand the film in a similar way? I think that most audience, most film goers, most audience members do not, certainly not on an intellectual or a conscious level. Mm-hmm. I know that because sound designers are always considering the same components of sound in the same way that composers do. We have to think about meter, tempo, timbre, pitch, duration, dynamics, all the tools that modern, any composer uses to create a piece of traditional music. So too do sound designers consider, Mm. but it takes a much more sophisticated ear to understand how we're doing it because so much of it is done in a realm that we're not familiar with. Because whereas we spend our lives immersed in music when we're not in the cinema, very few people spend time listening to my soundtracks outside of the cinema. And so we have a tuned brain and a tuned ear to music and we understand 12 tone scales and we understand 4/4 four, four rhythms and we understand abc song structures and th- that th- all that allows us to feel relaxed and comfortable within modern 18th 19th 20th century music the work that sound designers are doing not only is not taught but it's 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 rarely understood i would argue that most film composers fully appreciate the musicality that we're bringing to a soundtrack um, and are grateful for it. I I like to say that um, I I feel sorry for composers because they only have 12 notes to work with. Uh, Sound designers have the universe at their fingertips, Mm -hmm. but we work in dissonance and and harmony. Um, and a, a, a variety of, of of methodologies that our ears aren't tuned to listen for. So most audience members won't appreciate it, but I would argue they benefit from it in very subconscious ways. The the magic that we're pulling off in sound design is manipulative without ever drawing attention to itself. It is an interesting one because it's similar to the way music is sort of taught in film is that it's almost sort said to be best when invisible like you're supposed to experience it without really noticing it as an audience member in a way which yeah whereas a visual effects thing or uh especially in like a sci-fi film everyone goes wow that looks great no one really is going oh wow that sounds great or wow that music made me feel this way or whatever it's just yeah you just experience it at sort of an unconscious level i'll tell you a story on blade the best compliment i ever got was at a screening of blade runner at the motion picture academy here in los angeles and it was a very sophisticated audience and a, a filmmaker came up to me and said oh my god that that i'm so blown away by everything i just heard and one of the things that i loved was that I didn't know what was sound and what was music. And I said to him, that's brilliant. And you made my day because that was a conscious decision on the part of Denis Villeneuve. And that was a directive 
from Denis to um, Hans and Ben Walfish and Theo and I to quote, erase the boundaries. What that accomplishes is um, um, not only creating something that is simply the sound of that universe, but it relieves the audience on a subconscious level of having to track, even for but a moment, what is sound and what is music. Think about a sophisticated audience of filmmakers like yourself. You go to a film, and I, I guarantee that one, two, three, four times in a film, you're distracted for a moment by thinking, that was a great music cue, or yeah. I loved that sound effect. If you can erase those boundaries, you have more fully immersed the audience to enjoy the film on its own terms, which is to say, following the story. Every time you distract with a beat that draws the audience out to say, oh my God, that was the coolest spaceship sound, you might have done the audience a disservice. I have found as I get deeper and deeper sort of into my research and my experience making films and stuff, um, that seems to be happening more and more where like I'm pulled out of it by noticing something or experiencing something. And a lot of people ask me, they say, has it ruined films for you? And in, I think what's actually really interesting is great films are even better and bad films are even worse. That's sort of what I... <laughs> that's pretty good. That's, that's really sort of, good. That's sort of how I've ended up thinking it. So I come out of watching a film like Jude and I'm just going, wow, like they've yeah. done a really great job. But the, still, when it's a really good story, I still get pulled in and, I, and uh, you stop noticing everything because you're pulled into the story. But then I come out a film that's just really subpar and you're just going, man, this is just rough. But like, yeah, this and this and this was wrong. Yeah, and yeah. You heard it all. Okay, jumping into sort of the more general questions, focusing on um, the Disney films um, and specifically like a child audience, how um, important do you think film music is? Well, um, it, it's almost... Um... It, it, it's a leading question because the, the clear answer is monumentally important. Music and sound design are important to every film. I, I, it, it's funny, I'm going to sidetrack and then you have to get me back on answering this question directly. But one of the things that I, I, I am troubled by is when I am hired by a new filmmaker and they say something along the lines of, and I hear this more frequently than I'd like, Mark, I got to tell you, in my movies, sound is really important. And I think to myself, that is the most facile statement in the world. Sound is important to every movie, just as music is important to every movie. Now, um, back to your question, for younger audiences, um, Younger filmgoers do not have the um, listening faculty, the, the sophisticated listening faculty that an adult might, much less a sophisticated cineaster filmgoer. And so I would argue that the, the heavy lifting falls a little more greatly on music for younger audiences because it does some a slightly bigger job of the storytelling because you can lead an audience emotionally with score that's a little bit harder to do with sound design. And I, so I think the onus falls on the composer a little bit more when it's a, a younger audience. Um, you know, um, there's a, a re I'm sure you've heard this refrain in your studies and in your your social groups and in with your film going buds that movies are just getting too loud these days and i'm mentioning that because we as sound designers are responsible for that and it's all very often irresponsible irresponsible about the loudness of movies i say it because i can remember those early days on beauty and the beast and aladdin and lion king of the responsibility we had to younger audiences. And that meant we had to be even more diligent about how loud we made 
movies. Yeah. And I can specifically remember on Aladdin, we had had this great success. Uh, the, the team was the same. It was Terry Porter, Mel Metcalf, and Dave Hudson mixed the film. And John Pospisil and I and Dave Stone designed the films. Pardon me. And Beauty and the Beast went beautifully. And we got a little carried away on Aladdin. We were kind of full of ourselves. Sound had been nominated for an award. And I can remember Jeffrey coming in to the studio to hear playback of real one of Aladdin. And he had to really kind of throw cold water on the whole process. He, he had to call us out and say, guys, this is a family film. There's just too much going on. It's too loud. You've got too much sound in the surrounds. It's too distracting. You got to focus on our story and you got to put aside all that kind of puffery that you've added to this, this project that it just doesn't need. And I learned valuable lessons about that. And I've, I've leveraged those lessons from Katzenberg himself much later in, in, in my life. Just now it's my turn to sidestep slightly. Um, is Speaking about films getting louder, there's quite a debate going on in the, about them at the moment about the sort of eligibility of the dialogue. And I yeah. saw on um, Facebook today, Netflix po or someone posted stats from Netflix, and apparently 40% of people are using subtitles. Yes. Um, and so what, what's sort of your opinion on compared to films from the 90s, for example, um, where no one's really having this problem being able to hear the dialogue clearly? It is a significant problem. I have contributed to it. I am endeavoring to extricate myself from the complications we have in trying to make movies more intelligible. And here's an interesting phenomenon, and you can track the use of subtitles directly to the ascendance of streaming. Um, we also know that 70%, 70 to 80% of all streaming product is um, consumed in stereo, two channels. About 10 to 15% of that streaming audio is consumed in 5.1 or 7.1. 1 percent of that audio is streamed um, to the consumer at home in Atmos, and 1 percent of the 1 percent is consuming Atmos with actual discrete overhead speakers. So the picture I'm painting is one where the majority of the audience that is arguably turning on the subtitles is doing so because they're monitoring a stereo mix that was never listened to. And I, I, I can only speak about Los Angeles, but I'm, I'm, I get confirmation from my community from London and New York and other places where big movies are being mixed that we are being asked to go about the creation of soundtracks in a backwards manner. All studios require us, or not all studios, most studios want an Atmos mix, and they say in their delivery requirements that the highest format should be the format the film is final mixed in. Mm -hmm. Now, ask yourself this. If 70 to 80% of the audience is going to consume audio in stereo, why would you spend 90% of your time, actually more than that, 95% of your time mixing in Dolby Atmos when most people are going to hear it in stereo? It should be the other way around. You should spend 95% of your allotted mix time, which could be a week, 10 days, two weeks, three weeks in stereo. And when you what you discover is that when you do that, the dialogue becomes more intelligible because you don't, you, there's no subwoofer clouding things. There's no headroom issues. And you start realizing that that magnificent Atmos mix that you had made to be heard in a cinema um, is being auto mixed down to a stereo mix that almost no one monitors at our end. We're being irresponsible filmmakers by making a crash down in stereo of your Atmos mix or your 7.1 mix or even your 5.1 mix 
and that gets sent off without ever having being actually mixed. A, a robotic tool is doing that work. So we as a community share at least 50% of the responsibility for why this is an actual phenomenon. Mea culpa. Right. When I was doing some research during my undergrad, I found this stat about companies actually making TVs, and they found there was no correlation between sales and increased speaker quality. That um, a thinner TV, a bigger TV, yeah. a better picture, those yeah. sort of things increase sales. Whereas building a TV that had really, you know, decent inbuilt speakers was did not help with sales at all. So they've just pretty much speaker, your speakers on your home TV have hardly improved in the last 30 years. No, they've worsened, in fact, as you yeah. as you have just pointed out. Um, whereas um, so they, you know, they then try to sell on, sell a sound bar or whatever else they, you know, put with the TV. But um, yeah, for most people, it's a pair of AirPods and an iPhone on the train or like yeah. however they're listening to it, which is totally yeah. different to a cinema experience. There are a number of factors. I want to first take responsibility personally, but as you've rightfully pointed out, there are technological reasons why this is happening. There are sinister algorithms that are doing live down mixes on certain streaming platforms that mm. sound awful. There are television manufacturers that don't care about the quality of the speakers. And given that 70 to 80% of the audience is hearing in stereo, um, very often that's going to come from those really crummy um, TV speakers that are sometimes not even pointed at the listener. They're going to yeah. bounce off the wall, creating further acoustic anomaly. So yeah. all of that is compromising the listener's ability to, to really enjoy a project. You know, and then there's a couple of other really sort of uh, other anomalies that are fun to talk about that include um, the advent of what we call mumblecore. Um, mumblecore is a term that is that is tracked in the acting community where it became as as acting in cinema relied less on a, an outflow of actors out of live theater where you learn to project and to enunciate, mm. um, so too did the, 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 the delivery of dialogue started to lose that, 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 that clarity because you didn't have to worry about reaching the back seats anymore. And actors developed a propensity to mumble. And that means the onset person recording that dialogue had to do greater and greater amounts of trickery to capture dialogue that was essentially uncapturable. Mm -hmm. And so we have a contribution from from um, from our 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 our, co our friends in the acting community, and 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 we have an even smaller uh, subset of filmmakers who have decided that sometimes the dialogue isn't important. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> if, you, if you're tracking this problem, you know who I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so going back to the collaboration between musicians and sound designers, there's an instance in um, Beauty and the Beast where Belle's father is in the woods and one of the things that I noticed is the music is kind of dark and foreboding. Mm. But I, one of the questions I had was, which I've asked a couple other filmmakers, is the sound design that comes in there at the same time almost informs, at least the way I read it, that that music is scary music. I was just thinking, do you think that helps to inform the music and the overall scene? Do you think the music... Is helping to inform the sound design that it's scary, or is it a, a sort of a symbiotic partnership? I guess. Well, um, as I think back on that scene, I'm remembering again the filmmakers, um, Kirk and Gary, and Mr. Katzenberg again weighing in on this. It's a it's a really important moment dramatically in the film, and I remember preparing scarier sounds than what 
ended up in the final film. Mm. The filmmakers felt, and I think intelligently, that when the fear is generated from something that could exist in reality, which is not an orchestra, which is not deep celli and basses and whatever instrumentation Alan used, when it when it's something that you think could actually be real, it's even scarier. And my memory of it was pruning scarier sounds that I had designed and left it to sounds you could recognize. Yes, wolf howls are scary, but most people who saw the movie don't live in an area where, where wolves are a threat or bats yeah. are a threat. And you can, until even a, a young person can kind of absorb it and be slightly frightened. But I had made other sounds that made it terrifying with rumbles and tonal elements. And that went, that was just a little too far for them. And interestingly, my children, uh, maybe because they grew up with a father who listened critically and they heard sound at home all the time, music and sound design. My children from his, from the earliest ages had fear reactions to scary music. So when we watched Jaws for the first time and uh, they were five years old or four years old, the minute the, they had never seen the film, the minute they heard that, dun, 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 they ran out of the room. There was an instinctual reaction. I don't know if that was plotted by John Williams um, that, uh, to use tonalities that would resonate in some deep, dark recess of their primitive br lizard brain. Um, but he did. And they knew when music was scary and they didn't want any part of it. And they would always leave a movie up until their teenage years if they heard a, a, a score that was scary. It's interesting, even though the sort of research I've found so far leads to the idea that music or understanding film music is something you learn, one of the areas about it that they think is somewhat biological is the physics of music and the physics of sound, that something big makes a low sound and then right. something small makes a high sound. And, right. Um, so that, like, there's some part, like you said, of, like, the lizard brain that, like, you know, you hear something really low and rumbling and that's a predator, that's a threat, and yeah. then something, you know, high and squeaky is like a mouse or whatever, right. uh, something right. that's non-threatening. <laughs> right. Um, and that's All something, true. That's something that is innate, I guess, in people. It's evolutionary. Than, yeah, more so I, than complicated musical melodies or something. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you two small refinements on that idea, which I deeply believe in, and sound designers and composers leverage those ideas all the time. An evolutionarily um, embedded um, um, mechanism in the human brain is this idea of rumble. And we believe that it is um, 100,000 years of hearing a volcano or an earthquake, which is in those very deep frequencies. And if we weren't afraid of the rumble, we knew the rumble signified something very dangerous, which was an earthquake or a volcano erupting. Yeah. And that's hereditarily embedded for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, composers and sound designers use another um, real world uh, mechanism to create um, either a, a feeling of, I'm going to make up a word, languidity or excitement or anxiety, because we have a built-in metronome in our bodies that is the heartbeat. It is around 60 beats per minute. And you, 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 can, you can guarantee that when you, a composer or a sound designer uses a tempo lower than 60 beats per minute, you feel more at ease and more calm. And the moment that starts to rise or gets above if the minute you get to 80 90 100 120 beats per minute we recognize and we identify with anxiety because when we're nervous our heartbeat increases and th so that's such a simple sonic trope to leverage that that, that, that is a you, you it just works 
So while a child may not be able to vocalise sort of how music makes them feel, to what extent do you think they're affected by it? I know you had the anecdote earlier about your kids running out of the of the screening of Jaws when they're four years old, but do you think there's really sort of like to what level, that's kind of what I mean, do you think they're sort of understanding the film music? It really depends on the age. I mean, I can remember also moments with my children um, watching a movie in our small home theater. I have a little 5.1 sound system. And at a very young age, if you you, you played up, if you were watching a horror film or a, a suspense thriller where there's going to be a jump scare, if that that jump scare can be incredibly traumatizing to a child, so much so that it could cause them to not want to watch or consume media because they had this negative experience of being um, um, their nervous systems literally being overwhelmed if the mm-hmm. if there's a big you know shriek of some violins and uh, and a big subwoofer boom you you can really cause some 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 early damage with a child as as a child ages they learn to absorb that i think in a certain way um i'm trying to think of another way to to add some some more clarity about that yeah i guess one of the th- one of the things i've kind of conclusion coming to the more people i talk with is this idea i guess when i was originally um thinking about this i thought oh the filmmakers will know their target audience and they're making a film for that audience that they're going for and looking at these Disney films, it's generally under 10 yeah. years old. Um, yeah. But one of the things I found, the more people I talk to, is everyone's trying just to make a good film. Mm-hmm. Less so, oh, we're making a film for six-year-olds or whatever. So talking to composers and directors and things, it's like we're not really thinking about the way that kids understand films and about the way that they're able to read the film and understand character and right. and all the rest right. of it. We're just making a good film. The overall story somewhat is aimed at that age, but once we get the script done, we're just making a good movie and that's our story. Backtracking just a little bit, um, composers and sound designers um, have a very similar responsibility in this regard, and I think success is in the details. Mm-hmm. Um, arguably, we go to the cinema to have a transcendent experience we, we, because we want to get out of the house and experience something new. We know what the mundane is, our everyday lives, and we go to be entertained. And to be truly entertained, we have to have some level of transcendence, meaning experiencing something we've never experienced before. That that creates a, a challenge to composers and sound designers to do just a little bit of the equivalent of a jump scare, which is to say we have to present something novel that at some point in, in the movie-going experience um, challenges the audience. So that means maybe you don't make them jump out of their seat, but and you don't it doesn't have to be done with volume, but create content emotionally or dynamically that challenges the audience to stop back and feel like, whoa, I just felt something. Mm. That's what our job is. And um the, the 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 devil is in the details. If you do it just right. You get just the right reaction. You you pull the audience out of their 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 worldly experience and and throw them into another worldly experience. And I what I don't mean is otherworldly like science fiction. Otherworldly meaning something you've never experienced before. And so, for example, it doesn't have to be big loud sound in music. It doesn't have to be a jump scare. The the beauty of cinema music, my favorite cinema music, is music that makes me cry. I can't believe that the artifice of film, I know what a film is, and yet when the music is just right and it pulls at my heartstrings, I love that moment in a movie. And yet, my wife hates that. She hates being what she calls manipulated. Mm -hmm. So there's an incredible art 
in composing music that uh, draws out those emotions in an audience without being cloying. That the same the same um, um, uh, strictures hold true in sound design. I was speaking with someone the other day, and we were talking about how the word manipulation sort of has this sort of negative connotation with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think as far as films go, it shouldn't be that way. Like that's your job as a filmmaker is to manipulate yeah. the audience. Yes, to tell to your story. It. Yeah, it's all yeah. make believe. Exactly. It's all manipulation. <laughs> yeah, and you're trying to you're trying to make them feel something. Yeah, uh, get off your high horse, manipulate. You're there to be manipulated. You paid twenty dollars to be manipulated. I think that's one of the things that level of escapism that's missing from watching something on TV by yourself at home rather than going to a cinema and really being immersed by the story and experiencing something you haven't experienced before as a community with a group of people in the room yeah. with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I have a theory about that, and I'm no, I dropped out of college, so I'm no scientist. But I would argue, again, this idea of this hereditary uh, experience, this evolutionary experience, Human beings, for as long as we've been able to communicate and speak to each other, have been gathering around a flickering light, whether it's a campfire or a cinema projector, to tell stories to each other. And I think we connect with our ancestors when we do that communally. That's why I believe it's, a, it's so much, you can have a rich experience at home, no doubt about it, when you're at home by yourself, even on your little mobile device but i believe that we connect to something deeply hereditary when we do it communally and we feel like I, 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 this is the way it was meant to be this is this is the way it has it, all, it has always been thus we gather yeah. communally to have a shared experience and in so doing we feel more connected to our communities and My. that's that's enriching and a, a very important thing to have happen yeah my um one of my supervisors at uni he's um an australian aboriginal man and he is um a, the noongar man which is a, the area around where i live in western australia and they're the longest living culture sixty thousand years they've been here doing the same the same thing and um he uses that exact example he oh, what's that He's a filmmaker, and so he says it's the modern campfire. And he talks about, ah. um, and he talks about how the same stories he was growing up with elders in the community um, telling them. He's now using film as his medium to then yeah. tell those stories and to share story um, in the exact same way you would have as a group around a campfire. You know, I don't want this to turn into an anthropology lesson, but I, I think that I believe, because I did study anthropology, we are essentially um, group-oriented animals. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and as such, we we gravitate towards those experiences that unite us as groups. And I think ultimately, and my big, my big message, and then I'll get off my soapbox, is that all of humankind is a group and th that I wish we could, because there is an aspect to group behavior that divides us because in our um, primitive um, um, moments as a species, it was this group of Neanderthals versus that group of Neanderthals. And we had, we learned to honor our group without recognizing that we were all one group, in fact. Mm -hmm. And anything that unites us as a group is a good thing. So cinema does a good job of that. Um, are there any Disney music, like from early films, that you remember from your childhood that you stood out or that you sort of think were a bit of a moment when you were young that you went, wow, that, that's, you know, I guess elevated your experience a little bit? Like I think of The Lion King, for example, as one of the first films that I watched that I sort of went, wow, this is, I started to pick up more than just that it was a fun story. Uh, a couple jumped to mind immediately. One is um, Fantasia, because I I loved this idea of um, 
I th- in, in, in the later cinema, verna- cinema vernacular, they called it Mickey Mousing, but this um, might predate the expression because in uh, especially the Sorcerer's Apprentice and the Dance of the Hippos and a number of other sequences in Fantasia, the animation was drawn to match the beats of the music. Characters walked in sync with beats in the music. And that struck me immediately, even as a very young kid when I first saw it. And then um, l- much later on, um, the songs in Mary Poppins, I, I, I could sing, I, I won't sing every one of them for you. Yeah. <laughs> because the music was so compelling and was such a rich and integrated part of the storytelling. And so too, with Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin, the, the the musical was already falling out of favor in Hollywood. And I think it was that golden era, as it's been called, of Mermaid, Beast, Aladdin, Lion King, resurrected the musical and made us yeah. love them again because the music was beautiful and the lyrics were intelligent and they were perfectly integrated into the stories. You never felt like the movie stopped for a minute so that people could break into song, which is what many argue is what's wrong with modern musicals. The movie stops. So um, those beats in those Disney movies, and I know there's many others, um, always tickle me when it when it's a beautifully... I mean, one of my favorite movies of all time is West Side Story. That music makes me laugh and cry and sing in the shower and sing out loud in my den when I watch it. Yeah, and and it's on a constant rotation in my car on my playlist. Mm-hmm. My um, the Spielberg's one was the first West Side Story that I that I saw, um, but I have one of the older ones sitting on the shelf ready to watch. I'm not exactly oh. sure which which because there's two other ones before Spielberg, I think, but I can't remember. All I can they tell you is one of the greatest films of all time in every department is the Robert Wise um, version, West Side Story. Okay. It's extraordinary in every way. Acting, writing, directing, camera work, choreography, a songwriting, scoring. There's a um, hundred stories about West Side Story that make it incredible. Cool. I'll definitely make sure. Make I'll sure to see on. the Robert Wise version. It's, okay. You'll never be the same film goer. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, that about hits our 60 minutes. Um, thanks so much again for taking the time to um, have the chat. It's, um, it's been great. Thank you, Andy. It's been a pleasure. All right, have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.